Thank you. Please. Morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. It's, it's actually probably my first outing as a representative of the Italian government after, as has been just said, a long career in the private sector. So it feels like a new experience. And, and also it makes it easier because you can predict my view, the view will be very optimistic about things. Um, but I'll try to give you some um, elements uh, to think about the issue of government debt and how it's been dealt with uh, in the Italian case. Do I have something to move on, uh, to move forward my slides? Here? No. Ah, sorry. Okay, here we go. Okay, so I start from the most difficult chart. Uh, it's a chart that spans essentially my, my own, more or less, my own lifetime. Uh, the European Commission has a wonderful database, so you can reconstruct uh, the debt uh, of a country, uh, even of non-member countries, for a long period of time. So this curve starts in 1960. And you can see there that uh, Italy started at levels of debt, of government debt, as a share of GDP that today would make any prime minister very uh, proud and very happy and maybe encourage very lax fiscal policies because uh, the debt ratio was around 25%, 30% of GDP. Uh, but obviously then a number of things changed. I'm not going to spend the next five, you know, 15 minutes talking about history. Um, but essentially the story is that in the early 90s there was a renewed focus and emphasis on reducing government debt, and then Italy joined the euro. The expectation was that with low interest rates, the debt to GDP ratio would decline towards the benchmark of 60% of GDP. It happened to, to some extent with the recent revision of the GDP figures. We now know that uh, the ratio moved um, briefly below 100%. Uh, in the mid-2000s, but then the recent crisis dealt a huge blow to this attempt to reduce government debt, to stabilize it and then reduce it. Um, and what we have today is a ratio that's around 132, 133% of GDP, which we hope and we intend uh, to bring down over the coming years. Now, this chart is a bit complicated, but um, uh, it explains what happened in very recent years and why we are optimistic about the near term, let's say, the next few years. Uh, it breaks down the change in the debt to GDP ratio into main components. Some of you may be familiar with the simple equation that drives the dynamic of the debt to GDP ratio, but in essence, it depends critically on the difference between the interest rate paid by the government and the nominal growth rate of the economy, and then on whether the, the government has a primary budget surplus, that is a, a budget that is in surplus excluding interest payments. And then whether the, the country is able to get some uh, revenue from asset sales, so the so-called privatizations, uh, sales of real estate, and, and so on. So what happened in uh, 2011 and then in, in the first years in this chart, uh, 12 and 13, was really a perfect storm for Italy's uh, government debt. We had a recession, we, we had very high bond deals, we had to contribute to European uh, funds, the so-called bailout funds, to support other Eurozone countries. Uh, we also extended bilateral loans to Greece and all that raised uh, further our debt to GDP ratio uh, and it's the dark red component there. Um, what is in the jargon of economists is called the stock flow adjustment. Now for the coming years we, we expect that with the economy improving, as I will argue in a moment, um, continuing uh, emphasis on fiscal consolidation and hopefully low bond deals, then our debt to GP ratio will start falling and will fall by several percentage points per annum, um, especially from 2017 onwards. 
What's really important here, as I said, is the difference between how much the government is paying to fund its debt and the nominal growth rate of the economy. And you can see here um, the instantaneous level of bond deals, which is not what the government is paying, of course, because the government is paying uh, interest on the basis of bonds that might have been issued 30 years ago, 10 years ago, right? But if the government were to issue all its new debt today, um, the, the conditions today would be very favorable. So that means we have something that over time will erode uh, the debt to GDP ratio. Um, and he, here you see a comparison of Germany, France, and Italy. Germany at the moment is in the best position of all these European countries because, to give you an example, it is issuing, as we speak, 10-year uh, bonds at a yield of less than 60 basis points, that is 0 0.6. But in the first half of the year, the economy grew by around 3.4% in nominal terms. So even if the government didn't make a huge effort to further reduce its budget balance or improve the budget balance and reduce that, uh, the extremely low level of bond yields is providing um, obviously a huge help. And what we're seeing here is that now Italy is beginning to feel the benefits of falling bond yields, of the credibility of its own policy, and of course also the contribution from the monetary policy of the ECB. What I would like to point out is also that this credibility, this improvement has come from increased budget discipline. And instead of looking at budget balances, what I'm showing you here is how the nominal spending of the various of the larger uh, Eurozone members has evolved since the start of the monetary union in 1999. So I made uh, expenditure in 1999 equal to 100, nominal terms, so these are euros, it's not a ratio to uh, GDP, and I compare uh, Italy, France, Germany, and so on. So Italy is the green line, um, and you can see there that essentially when we properly account for the so-called 80 euro bonus for low-income households as not being part of expenditure, um, the nominal level of expenditure in recent years has been growing by less than 0.5% per annum, 0.5. So essentially this means the moment our economy resumes growing, um, we tend to have a reduction in the share of expenditure over GDP. You can see there that our French friends have kept um, on a line that's more or less unchanged compared to previous, uh, to, to, to a pre-crisis situation, uh, government expenditure is still rising in nominal terms. Uh, Spain, which is the yellow line, has been very, very well behaved in recent years, but that comes after a period of ex, ex, you know, extremely fast growth in government expenditure pre-crisis, that is, until uh, 2007. So this increased control over spending, this stability in nominal spending means we can improve our primary budget, um, that is our budget balance excluding interest payments, and hopefully uh, engender a more favorable debt dynamic. Now coming to the economy, as you may know, uh, Italy has had an unusually long recession uh, following the Lehman crisis and then the Greek crisis and only uh, around the turn of the year we have come back to positive uh, real GDP growth. Um, the growth rate in the first half of the year has been 1.4% on an annualized basis, that is Q2 over Q4 of, of last year. Obviously, we would like to see an even higher growth rate, um, but it is an encouraging uh, sign that at last um, in part because of the actions of the Italian government, the growth rate has gone back into positive. And more recently, actually, Italy has <coughs> clearly shown signs of a further improvement in economic sentiment uh, that for the first time in quite uh, a long while has taken our indicator above the uh, European one and the Eurozone one. The chart shows that in September, 
uh, this synthetic index of consumer and business confidence was very close to the reading for Spain and way above the readings for Germany and France. So if this improvement in uh, economic confidence continues, we are confident that these readings are actually compatible with the growth rate uh, in excess of 2%. We haven't put that in our forecast, but we, we think it's doable. Obviously, we also have um, the challenge of very low inflation. Uh, the latest official figures show that the implicit price deflator of our uh, GDP uh, has grown by close to zero in the first half of the year. Um, so we've had a bit of real growth, but we don't get much additional growth in nominal terms from, from inflation. That is a sign that the economy is still uh, operating in a condition of excess capacity of slack. And this chart is a chart that I've insisted on putting in all our recent policy documents because it's like acknowledging how bad the situation has got and also to explain that we don't, understand, we don't agree completely um, with the policy implication of the methodologies used at the European level. Uh, because this chart shows how uh, our GDP was progressing in real terms um, until pre-crisis, and then the fall it has experienced, and then the official projection, which is, in fact, quite cautious, but it also shows what would have been the level if we had continued on the unspectacular trend of the 2000s. We would be almost 20 points higher than where we are today. And this is the most important reason for whatever you read will come out today from Italy's 2016 budget. Um, there's been a lot of um, a talk about uh, the political motives for what is being uh, planned for next year, but the real fundamental story is, is that uh, we feel our economy is only in the early stages of a recovery, the global environment has become much more challenging with a slowdown in emerging markets, and therefore, we want to combine fiscal discipline uh, with, um, a, uh, I wouldn't call it a stimulus, but at least a support for economic activity that's targeted, as I will say in a moment, on uh, specific areas of the economy. In terms of our expectations, uh, we think the economy, um, because of the negative carryover um, inherited from 2014, will grow at an average rate just below 1% or around 1% this year, and then will accelerate to 1.6 next year in terms of real growth. We also hope that, uh, or expect, that there will be a, a bit of um, a pickup in inflation from an extremely low rate. Because of that, we are looking for a nominal growth rate of 2.6% next year. Clearly, in all this and in anything I will say in a moment on debt stabilization and reduction, uh, this is the critical factor. And the stability uh, program, which was released only a few weeks ago, uh, set uh, a further reduction in the budget deficit, in the overall budget deficit, uh, to 2.2% of GDP for next year, from 26 this year. And the goal is essentially to come to uh, balance, or budget uh, balance, uh, in 2018-2019. I will spare you a discussion of uh, all these cyclically adjusted budget balances. But the important point here, because we are talking about debt, is that the official estimate is that the debt-to-GDP ratio at the end of this year will be around 132.5 and will fall to 120% by 2019. Still a very high level, but uh, no less you know, than 12 and a half points below where we expect to be this year. How are we going to do this? Obviously, we need a bit of uh, support from uh, external factors. Uh, we need support from monetary policy. Uh, the ECB at the moment is following a very accommodative monetary policy. Uh, but then we have a budget that combines uh, spending control with uh, targeted support in terms of tax cuts. Our prime minister has announced 
that uh, he would like to reduce property tax next year, corporate taxation from next year, and if not, from 2017, and then have a further reduction in personal income tax in 2018. For the time being, we have modeled the first two um, steps in this process, that is uh, the cut in corporate taxation and a reduction in the real estate tax. Meanwhile, the government will continue to in incentivize investment uh, in various forms. One way is we accelerated amortization, so companies that make new investments will be able to amortize investment at a multiple, but probably a 1.2, but it's not official as we speak, um, uh, uh, throughout the period uh, uh, of amortization of their investment. There will continue to be incentives for R&D, uh, energy efficiency, uh, so all the things that were already uh, put in place uh, last year. There was a safeguard clause that would have hiked the VAT next year that will be repealed, uh, and the government, in order to do that, will use all the flexibility available within the Stability and Growth Pact uh, in Europe. Um, it would, obviously, there will be measures to improve tax compliance. There is a voluntary disclosure of foreign income and assets to provide us with some additional revenue. Um, and obviously, we will continue to have forms, uh, initiatives aimed at uh, improving social cohesion, including poverty alleviation. Um, in parallel with this, Italy has a very ambitious um, structural reform plan, which is consistent with recommendations from uh, the European Commission. Uh, it includes a labor market reform, which has almost been completed, the so-called Jobs Act, uh, measures that reform the banking sector and should facilitate the ability of banks to offload non-performing loans, uh, measures to enhance the, the competition in the service sector of, of the Italian economy, including professions or activities that have been traditionally controlled by um, you know, uh, sectoral uh, rules, self-imposed uh, regulations uh, that make it very difficult for outside investors uh, to uh, take a stake in those businesses. So we hope and we intend that from next year uh, it will be possible for investors to, in, for instance, invest in Italian pharmacies, in, in or pharmacy chains, to invest in uh, law firms, uh, in a number of uh, sectors, as I said, where we would like the economy to have a much faster growth rate. Uh, there is also an ongoing process of reforming taxation, trying to make it more efficient, uh, judicial system, uh, some meaningful results have already been achieved in reducing the length of civil court cases, in unwinding the backlog, reducing the backlog of outstanding cases in Italian tribunals. Uh, there is, there's been a significant reform of education that uh, reinstate the concept of merit in assessing teachers. Um, uh, also, a deep reform of the public administration is currently being read by the parliament, and a, a big effort within also the budget for next year to um, boost uh, infrastructure investment, to improve our transportation networks, uh, broadband, and, and, uh, and so on. So, th the agenda is clearly uh, focused on revitalizing the economy and combining that with fiscal discipline uh, because obviously we do want to reduce our debt to GDP ratio. I will just close with a few uh, charts that show you projections for the longer term. If we stay the course of fiscal discipline, uh, the line in the middle of that chart is essentially extrapolation of our policy beyond the time frame of our stability program, which is 2019, and out to, uh, say, the following 10 years. If we continue along that policy, by the end of that period, our debt to GP ratio, even on conservative growth assumptions, uh, will be around 95% of GDP. Clearly, a very long way, a continuing effort, but there's no alternative if you want uh, to reduce your public debt the right way, in other words, without any 
uh, restructuring, rescheduling, uh, but simply by uh, de-accumulating uh, this debt uh, uh, as the economy grows and you keep your uh, public finances in order. Um, for the very long term, I will just show you what we expect to happen by 2060. And um, it, over this very long period of time, uh, Italy actually compares reasonably well with other European countries, primarily because of how age-related expenditure will evolve over time. Uh, the, the reforms of the pension system in particular uh, have produced a stabilization in projected pension spending uh, so that, for example, if we keep the uh, primary surplus uh, to around 3.1% after the horizon of uh, our current uh, stability program, then we should uh, get very close to the famous 60% uh, of GDP target. If we have a more ambitious uh, surplus of 4% of GDP, we might be able to totally unwind our uh, government debt by 2060. But this, you know, obviously the world will change. We don't know what will happen over such a long uh, time frame. Uh, but this is just to say that we are um, convinced that if uh, we stick to these policies, we, we can uh, go back to a more normal situation in terms of government debt. One final point, uh, pension reform has been a huge political issue in Italy. It was done in four main installments, the last one being at the end of 2011 during uh, a period of huge stress in the financial markets. Well, uh, those reforms have been very important. Unfortunately for us, they came too late uh, to prevent uh, the rise in public debt that we have had. But today, they make the numbers look uh, a, a lot better. So you just look at the lowest curve and the highest curve. If we hadn't uh, undertaken these reforms, we would be at best on that top curve, even if we stuck to huge fiscal discipline from here on. Uh, with the reforms we have introduced, if we have a large primary surplus, our debt to GDP ratio will go to zero by 2060. So obviously the policy, the right policy, lies somewhere in between. We don't need to take our government debt uh, to zero. Um, I'm old enough to remember around the year uh, 2000 when the US budget was in great shape and the debt to GDP ratio was folding. A lot of people fretting over the possible disappearance of the government bond market, which is obviously the core of how the financial markets price yields and, and therefore financing for companies. So I wouldn't wish that we get to zero, but I would be delighted if over my lifetime and at least my work life, I see uh, the debt to GDP ratio falling uh, much closer to the European norm. Uh, and closer to the level of our uh, trading partners, because I think at that point, uh, we might be able to have very significant tax cuts and to make our economy much more dynamic. I'll close here, thank you.